Well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming out tonight. This is a wonderful crowd, and what a beautiful space this is to be able to speak to you uh, and gather together. And I've driven through Leesburg before. Uh, I've given some talks in the villages. That's where I've principally been heading. But I never came over this way. And this is just a beautiful park that, that you have here. So a wonderful uh, expansion of my knowledge of this part of, of Florida. So thank you very much for coming out here tonight. Uh, the topic of my talk tonight is George Washington's leadership at the end of the American Revolution, as revealed in an event called, or best known as, the Newburgh Conspiracy. So it's a very mysterious business. George Washington and the rumored rebellion that threatened the revolution. So I'm covering tonight a two-year period at the end of the American Revolution. So this is about the way the American Revolution ended. Um, in October of 1781, we have what turns out to be the climactic victory for the Americans over the British at the Battle of Yorktown. And that is October of 1781. And I said there in passing, you may have caught that, that this turns out to be the climactic victory because it was not at all clear at the time that this was going to be the thing that ended the war. Okay. So can we get a huzzah for the victory over the British? Okay, there you go. Right, so a great American victory. They, the American and the French forces defeated the British at, at Yorktown. Okay. Uh, so a major British army has been defeated for the British war effort. Things are not going in the direction they wanted. This is in 1781. So they've been fighting for six years already, since 1775. And they're not making progress and things are going backwards for the British. However, the war is not over, uh, and the war does not end for another two years. And I'm going to kind of belabor this point, uh, which is that the people living at the time, they don't know what's going to happen next. They don't know if the war will be renewed, if the British will send more reinforcements. They don't know if the, there's a, there are peace negotiation, negotiators in Europe ready to, ready to go, but will they be successful? How long is this all going to take? So um, in the immediate aftermath of the victory at Yorktown, Washington receives all of these congratulatory letters. And I've read, a, I've read a bunch of these. And they go on and on, heaping praise on him. Your, the greatness of your feet of arms will live for all eternity and will signal the birth of American independence. And you truly deserve all of the enconiums that are bestowed upon you. Okay? And on and on and on, laying on thick like that. So Washington has to write back. Right? I thank you for your kind words. This is truly a, a, an achievement of, of our troops that have been supported by our people. Right? You, gotta, you can't ignore anybody else. You've got to give everybody credit, right? It um, goes on like that. And then, but, like, but, the war isn't over yet. That victory, when they surrendered, they didn't, like, exchange a peace treaty that recognized our independence. And anything could happen. Washington fully expected the British to renew the war in the spring of 1782. The British policymakers uh, in England, not that Washington knows this, but in England, uh, King George, for example, expects to keep fighting. When uh, the Prime Minister, Lord North, um, learns of the British surrender, he's crestfallen, he's devastated. He knows that it can't go on very much longer. King George, though, says, okay, what's the plan to still win? And when his advisors have to gently say, you know, your, your highness, uh, perhaps we should plan for a peace that will demonstrate your great magnani magnanimity. <laughs> uh, I was like, what? Wait, wait we're still going to win. So uh, it is not at all clear that the victory at Yorktown will be the, the final blow. Um, there are, there's still a significant British presence in North America after the victory at Yorktown. So Lord Cornwallis's, uh, he's a British commander, he surrenders his force, but the British still occupy important positions throughout the country. The British occupy Savannah, Georgia. The British occupy Charleston, South Carolina. The British occupy, I believe it's New Bern, North Carolina. That one's not as famous. Uh, the British still occupy a lot of their forts that they have in the Great Lakes region. 
Maybe it would be easier to list the places they don't occupy. <laughs> uh, Philadelphia. And the most important of all is that the British occupy New York City. Okay. So they still hold on to New York City. Um, so you can see Washington has a point, right? They've defeated one army, but there's still, the British occupy the major seaports and these important uh, forts in the Great Lakes region. They don't have Boston, they don't have Philadelphia, but they have a lot of the other important pieces as well, okay? So don't get too excited yet is Washington's message. Now, during this, this period, after the victory at Yorktown, but before a peace treaty can be formalized, a number of tensions started to come to the surface. These were issues that had been present throughout the American Revolution, but had been kind of tamped down because the pressure of winning the war was always more immediate. So these are problems everybody recognized, but they couldn't really deal with them because if they don't deal with this other problem about the war, the, they're going to lose and then these other things are just moot. There's no point in going on with them. Okay? So these are issues that now can come to the surface because the military situation has kind of eased off a bit. Okay? Washington continues warning everyone we need to prepare for war, but there is kind of a palpable relaxing of the, the tensions there. So now other issues can come to the surface. One major issue was the nation's finances. So the nation's finances were, uh, to use the technical historical term, a big mess uh, <laughs> throughout the war. Okay. So there was runaway inflation. When I started this project, that was like, a, a, hey, I started this project, you know, like 2016, 2017. Inflation was something I had to explain to students, like what, how, why those bad, what it was like, you know. And now they get it right away, so that saves. <laughs> That saves class time, but I, I'd be willing to uh, sacrifice that for our dollars being worth more. What had happened uh, during the war, in order to pay for the war, is that the uh, Continental Congress prints money right, to pay for their expenses. And that money is supposed to be backed by tax collection. Okay? They're, they're, not, they're not crazy. They don't just print it out of nothing. It's supposed to be tied to taxes that are collected. Okay? But the war gets expensive fast, so they print more money. And then they print more. And then, right back. Okay, and then they print some more money. And then they print a little bit more. And then they need more, so they print it. <laughs> you get the idea. It goes on, it goes on and on, um, printing more money over and over and over again. So the, 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 value, the, the, the dollar depreciates in value. The, the currency was named the continental dollar. So the continental dollar, that's the name of the currency that they use. This is an example of a continental dollar. Uh, actually, this is a, I can't see it, is a $3 note? $4 note, a $4 note. Okay. Uh, can anyone guess who designed the, the, the way the currency looked? Right. Exactly, I was gonna, <laughs> yes, the guy who does everything. It's not fair that he could be so talented at all different things. Okay? Um, so Benjamin Franklin designs the, the continental dollar. And he chooses various patriotic designs in order to inspire Americans. Okay? So this is the, uh, you may not be able to make it out on the screen there, but that is the patriotic wild boar. <laughs> Because of course, what else would it be? <laughs> so that's the patriotic wild boar. Why was the patriotic boar, or why was the wild boar patriotic? Because it was a, a wild boar was said to mind its own business unless it was provoked. And then it would defend itself ferociously. And you can, you can probably guess what the analogy that Franklin is building here that the American colonies were happy to be left alone to run their own affairs, but it, they were provoked by the British, so they will defend themselves ferociously by buying things with a $4 bill. <laughs> okay, so that's the design there. Um, so that was one of the major ways in which the Continental Congress paid for things, is by printing money. They also borrowed money principally from France. France was extremely generous. I mean, they're profligate in their generosity. 
Uh, I mean, and literally, because they, they would have their own financial problems fall in the 1780s, they would end in their, their revolution. So they really took one for the team there by sacrificing their own, uh, their own stability for our, for our good. They, they would loan money, they would just give gifts. My favorite type of financing is where they loaned the money to the United States and then covered the interest on that loan. <laughs> Where's that bank's mortgage officer? I wanna, <laughs> I wanna get in on that. Um, so those kinds of things they do. Then they also, uh, there were American uh, bondholders so who bought the debt of the United States. That, that's smaller than the, um, the foreign loans and things like that. But those are the principal ways in which the war was financed. Okay. Uh, there is a point, and I can never remember the date. I believe it's in early 1778, where the Continental Congress stops printing money. They just stop. Because they realize that they are ruining perfectly good blank paper. <laughs> because blank paper has many different uses. Right? You can do all kinds of things with it. But once you put, print money on it, it only has one use. Well, maybe two uses. Uh, but we'll keep, it, uh, we'll keep things clean here. Uh, so that's, right, you're ruining, it has more utility blank than it does with money printed on it. So that's the situation. And they just do, um, they just do without it. Okay? So that is the financial problem. Um, there we go. Oh, there's the animation form part of the lecture today. <laughs> it shrunk in value. <laughs> okay, so ends the special effects. Uh, another problem had to do with the political situation. The United States in 1781 began formally operating under the form of government known as the Articles of Confederation. Now, did you notice something about the way I phrased that? I said they formally started operation under the Articles of Confederation in 1781. What were they doing since July 1776? What was the form of government? That, that's a trick question. <laughs> there was no formal form of government. They made it up as they went along. I mean, literally, it would make up, okay, we're gonna do this, this, this trade, this is our process, no, this doesn't work, let's do something else. Well, we, they have uh, one committee structure, then they break it all apart, do other committees, and that doesn't work any better, so they go back to the old system. Okay, so they make it up as they go along. Now, the, the Articles of Confederation had been written, uh, they had been written and agreed to, uh, I believe in 1777, I wanna say, so fairly early on, but they, were, they had to be approved by all the states and there were a couple of states that were holdouts. You just would not go along with it. The issue, I believe, was the last holdout was Maryland, and they were upset with Virginia about overlapping land claims in the West. And they just wouldn't give it up uh, until that question was resolved. And then they got the formal structure of the government going. The structure of the government, in, um, in brief, is that the states have the, the real power. So the states have the power, and the central government, warning, I will, I will get mixed up and call it the federal government, but it's really not. It's the, the central government, okay? The central government is really the agent of the states. And the Continental Congress is the legislature, but it really exists as kind of a, not really a legislature that make, makes laws that are binding on the states. It is more like a forum for representatives from the states to come together and hash out their, their disagreements. It um, works best when it is having to make decisions quickly for the war effort. Without that pressure to get stuff done, well, let's just say that most of the members are lawyers. <laughs> and most of the members are well-educated. And what do most of the members fancy themselves to be great speakers? You put those three elements together and you have guys making hours and hours long speeches okay. and not really getting a whole lot done, wrangling over finer points of procedure. Um, they, they, so they are not really getting a lot done. The, they don't pass laws, but they pass resolutions. And a resolution is more or less imploring the states to do something. Okay. So they'll make a resolution and it's up to the states to carry it out or not, mostly not, unless they happen to want to. 
Okay. So a lot of the states, if the states had the final decision about implementing a resolution, uh, how to do it, but also really whether to do it at all. So this, the central government is weak. It is really, in a way, it's more like the UN, um, not just because they argue pointlessly, uh, but because these are kind of diplomatic representatives of sovereign states. And that's how the states see themselves, is they are sovereign for pretty much everything except foreign policy and the war effort, which has to have a collective response. Okay. So one of the things that the uh, Articles of Confederation government will try to do in 1782 and into 1783 is they'll try to establish some mechanism for paying back the loans that are owed, for stabilizing the currency. In order to do that, they need to collect tax revenue. They cannot collect any tax revenue of their own. So the, the Philadelphia central government can't, no money goes to them directly from, from any source. They ask the states and the states collect it from their people. And you can guess about how well that goes. Every state has an excuse for why they can't pay. There are a bunch of deadbeats, right? They say, you know, we don't have the money, the British are occupying our major city, how are we supposed to collect uh, taxes on imports if the, if the British occupied New York City, it just can't be done. Um, some officials in Philadelphia pointed out, well, you have the rest of the state too. There are farms in Albany, tax them. Well, well no, we can't do that. Uh, so that kind of excuse. They get rivals also. They say, we've paid our fair share, but our neighbor hasn't. Why does Connecticut get off light in, in their tax bill? We're Massachusetts, we always get dumped on. We always have to pay the way most. We sent the most soldiers, which they did. Right? That's our sacrifice. Let those Connecticut guys come up with something for a change. Okay? So all those reasons. Now, oftentimes, no, there, there are, these reasons are legitimate. Right? So it is hard to raise tax revenue when the British occupy your major seaport. That, that is hard to do. But it seems like everybody has their own excuse why either their bill isn't fair or why it's just impossible to come up with the money. Okay? So that's, um, that's the situation with the Continental, uh, the Continental Congress. Okay? So the Congress versus the states of the Articles of Confederation, and it's the states that really have the power over and against the uh, central government, such as it is in Philadelphia. Okay. I'm stalling for time there, did you notice? Because I, I had a story I wanted to remember. I remembered it, good news for everybody. Uh, I mentioned how they wrangle over pointless procedural points. There's one, kid, there's one example in this whole process where they need to decide whether the vote is by a supermajority, like, so nine out of 13 states, or a simple majority, so seven out of 13 states. Okay. I should mention that voting under the Articles of Confederation is done by state delegation. So each state gets one vote, no matter how many representatives happen to be there. And they go back and forth and they say, okay, I think that we, had, we, we can change the rules to say this is a simple majority. Okay. I say, well, is that a simple majority vote or a nine out of 13 vote. Oh, that's a real head scratcher. Then somebody realizes that regardless, there are nine states in favor of whatever the measure is. So their whole hour of fighting was for nothing because they didn't bother to count how many states were in favor of it from the beginning. So that is the kind of situation that they are in. Okay. Okay. Now I wanna talk about the, um, the army. So meanwhile, with the army, their situation. So the bulk of the army is stationed in, uh, along the Hudson River in New York. So uh, around uh, Newburgh, New York, well, I just say that and everybody knows where it is, right? Um, so this is up the Hudson River, okay? Uh, New Windsor is another place where they are. West Point is the one you probably heard of previously. So they're along the Hudson River um, that's where the bulk of the army is stationed. There are about 10,000 men under Washington at that point, and there's a smaller force that's in South Carolina at the time, and some other men, uh, other parts of the army are detached in Pennsylvania, out in the west, okay, but mostly it's ten, the 10,000 men in the Continental Army. Note there, for example, 10, 000, that's not that many guys, and that's really not that many. Washington rarely has more than that, and sometimes has significantly fewer than 10,000 men in his army. Okay. One of the things I like about studying this period is that that's manageable. I can wrap my head around that. I don't know how Civil War historians do it with 100,000 men under arms. And I certainly have no idea how World War II historians do it 
with a million men to, keep, to try and keep track of where all, where all those parts are deployed. Okay. I like my 10,000 man small continental army. Okay. Um, so they are stationed in, along the Hudson Valley. This is a, um, a painting that was done by Pierre L'Enfant. And if my French pronunciation is not too mangled, uh, do, who do you know, where else do you know, may, may know Pierre L'Enfant from? He's the right, he's the architect who designed Washington DC. So he is uh, right, a Frenchman who is a, visiting the American army. And he paints this picture here. It's from the period, from the 1780s. So that, that is a representation of what it would look like. It's a large piece. So it is a kind of, it's a, a panorama. So it goes, right, extends beyond the, the screen there. Uh, so it's a big, big piece you can, you can see there. So you get some idea of what life was like there. The army that's stationed there, they are pretty much waiting for one of two things to happen. Number one, the British break out of New York City to renew the war. So they're there waiting if that happens. Number two thing they're waiting for is news of a peace treaty. And until, and until one of those two things happens, they sit around and wait. And that's what they do um, during the winter of 1781-1782. That's what they do for the year of 1782. That's what they do for the winter of 1782-1783. And the news of the peace treaty ar will arrive in April of 1783. So it's basically over a year of just waiting for something to happen. You can guess what happens when young men are waiting around for something to happen. <laughs> and not just, you know, not just waiting around bored, but this is, they can see this is, this is the end, right? Just have to make it and then I can go home. Why can't I go home? No, no nothing's happening. I have a life to get on with. Um, I have a farm that's, that's suffering, or I want to have a farm someday, especially for the younger men. I need to get my career moving, not just sit on the shelf doing nothing. It'd be one thing if they're fighting, because then you could win glory in battle. And that'll impress, uh, they'll impress the ladies back home and their fathers and all that. When you show up in your uniform as the major or the colonel, that would look great. Okay. Sitting around doing nothing, growing a year older, that's not very helpful for anyone. Okay. Now during that time that they're sitting around waiting, okay, um, let me cut a couple of pictures here. Uh, this is, George Washington's headquarters. So he takes over this home here. It belonged to a Dutch widow, the widow Hasbrook. And um, it was the, the advanced team found this. They thought it was uh, uh, ideal for Washington's purposes. It was large enough that he could live there. Uh, Martha comes with him. Martha, Martha accompanies him through, through much of the war. Washington called his aides his military family. So his military family, those are the young officers. Hamilton was a, uh, was a uh, part of his military family at one point. Then they were falling out. Okay. Um, so that is his house there. They, this, the Dutch widow was not keen on this. She did not want to share her house with George. You can imagine, like, I, I, you know, I, it's, like, it's an old lady. This is my house. I'm comfortable here. I don't care if this father of the country, father of his country stuff. You know. Leave my house alone. They, 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 they tried to tell her, look, we're going to build all kinds of great stuff. We're going to build updated stables and more outbuildings. It's going to raise the value of your property significantly. And it doesn't want to hear about that. Uh, eventually, the old lady moves out to go live with some uh, relatives in New Paltz, which is further down, closer to New York. And she says that she will not live a night with George Washington. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, that's her house there. So that's Washington's. Uh, headquarters. That is in Newburgh, New York. That is a couple miles north of where the bulk of the army is located. So the bulk of the army is living in New Windsor. So another small New York town very close by. They uh, build themselves these little log cabins for their winter, uh, their winter um, shelter. If they didn't have these log cabins, what would they have? Yeah, a tent and not one of those Coleman tents that keeps out the cold. It's gonna be a canvas one. And you gotta snuggle your tent mate, I guess, to keep warm. So the, uh, these little huts here, they call them huts, little, little, little log cabins. So they built that, that keeps them busy for a while. Okay. Now that looks, uh, it looks okay. I mean, there are worse ways you can spend the winter. Um, you know, there's a little chimney there, you can run a fire, it would be, be cozy enough until you realize that it's about 
10 to 12 guys will be sharing that one cabin. Yeah. 10 to 12 men, 18 to 22, sharing that small cabin. Men who do not have especially high standards of hygiene. And even if they did, they don't have a latrine nearby. It's really funny to read Washington's general orders because like regularly he has to tell the men, right, do not let the, how does it, do not let the, um, what is the word? Um, he said, do not, do not, I forget the word he uses. Oh, I'm, I'm thinking on it. Uh, he says, not to let things pile up by your, by your hut. <laughs> you can guess what the, the things are, okay? I know what he calls it. He says, uh, do not let filth pile up by your house. And okay, I, I, at first I figured that was what? Because I don't have a, I thought it was like garbage and stuff, right? And then I'm reading some of these and like, wait a minute. That's not garbage he's talking about. That's a different kind of filth and gross. Come on, guys. Um, so that is, the, that is the cantonment in New Windsor. Okay. While the men are sitting in their, their cabins there, uh, trying to keep some semblance of order, trying to limit the outbreak of what was called barrel fever. What was barrel fever? What was barrel fever, anybody? Yeah, alcoholism, yes. Yeah, here you go. Yes. Uh, that was barrel fever, when they get into the whiskey ration. Yeah. What else is there to do? Uh, the officers, in particular, the officers get to talking among themselves. And the officers start to talk about all the sacrifices that they've made during the war. They talk about how they have gone without pay for the bulk of the war. And when they were paid, which is not very often, they are paid in inflated continental dollars. They're not really worth very much. They talk about how they were promised pensions at two points during the war. So there are two points during the war in which a wave of officers resign. So it's a, a number of guys, they say, I've had it enough. I'm gonna resign my commission and go back home. I've done my duty, I can't do any more. In order to keep them in the army toward, until the end, Congress promised them, promises them a pension. Um, at first it's a half, half pay for seven years, and then after Benedict Arnold's treason is discovered, they think, uh, maybe we better pay these guys so nobody else gets an, any Arnold ideas. Uh, they offer them half pay for life. Okay. So if you survive, you could get half, half of your salary, half, half your officer's pay for life after, uh, after the war concludes. And that's enough to, to stem the flow of officer resignations. You need, and you really need officers because they're the ones who keep control over the men. If you don't have enough officers, then the men are going to go wild. At least that, that's the fear. So they, they need that. Well, they can see that they were promised these pensions when the war ended. This is so typical of Congress or any legislative body. They pass the law now and they let somebody figure out in the future how to pay for it. So that's what the Continental Congress did twice during the war. Said we will we'll bet your pensions, but we'll figure out how to pay for it later. And they did not set aside any money during the war. Um, and now the war is ending and the officers can see those, there's no money. The pensions haven't been paid. The, the, in order to, to reduce expenses, the army is reduced in size somewhat. So it'll send like a, a thousand guys home and a um, appropriate number of officers to go with them. Those officers who are retired early, you think, all right, let's get our pensions. Let's go get our life on, on, on going here. They do not get paid their pensions because there's no money set aside for that. So now the officers who are still in the army say, well, that's going to happen to us. That'll be us someday soon if nothing happens. Okay? And it's pretty clear that nothing, there's been no movement in setting aside money for that purpose. Okay. At the end of 1782, okay, at, the set, at the end of 1782, the officers get organized. And they um, meet among themselves and they, they, they hash out you know, what's really most important to us, what are really upset about and they send a memorial to Congress. This is uh, a kind of petition. There's a technical difference between the two, but for our purposes, it is a, basically a petition to Congress, representing their grievances and saying exactly what they want. 
Okay? So they talk about how they have made these sacrifices, how they have given up the, the, the time with their families, that their families ha have suffered. That some of the younger men have not been able to form families because they've been in the army around other guys the whole time. Okay? So those kind of complaints. They end the uh, memorial by, by a couple of lines that are, I want to point out here. They say, our distresses are now brought to a point. The un, they continue, the uneasiness of the soldiers for want of pay is great and dangerous. They say, and then they ask um, that they, they um, ask for a fund of money to be forwarded to the army in order to discharge the, the, the government's obligations towards, towards the army to keep everybody happy. Now, you know what they've done here. They've done something clever or, or subtle here. They have mentioned that it's the soldiers, meaning the enlisted men, who the danger is from. Not necessarily the enlisted men who pose the greatest danger. It is the officers who are upset. They, they don't come out and say that directly, however, because that's like, that's too bold. That's too much of a kind of threat. So they're saying, it's the enlisted men. You know how they are. And all the elites in Congress are kind of condescending towards uh, ordinary people. Oh, like, yeah, yes, we know they, they are. Um, one excuse from the superintendent of finance about why they, is, why they really don't have to send them any money right away. He, he comes out and says, those kinds of people will just spend it on whiskey anyway. <laughs> really, those kinds of men, that's what he says. Um, so it's better that they don't get paid. You know, they, they, get a, they get a meal, they get shelter. If you give them money, they'll just get drunk on it. So it's actually better for them if they're not paid. That's, that's, the, that's the rationale he gives to himself. Okay. So that's, that's the attitude. It's really the officers, though, who are kind of saying what they want indirectly through the soldiers. So that is the situation through the end, December of 1782. The memorial arrives at the at late December that year in Philadelphia. It's taken uh, in person by several officers. They read it to the assembled Continental Congress. The congressmen listen to this. They say, yeah, this is all very reasonable. We know you sacrificed greatly. We, have, we know we've promised you money. There's just two problems. We don't have any money now. And we don't know how we're going to get any money in the future. I guess there's a third problem. We don't have a time machine to go back and get you money either. So there's nothing in the past either. Okay, well, that's the problem. Congress is working on the problem, but it runs into the reality that the states are in control. And the states, either they don't, they don't have the money to pay either, and they certainly don't want to give the money to Congress to pay on their behalf, because that whoever pays the money is where someone's loyal to. So they don't want an army loyal to a central government outside of state control. That's a path to tyranny. They don't like that. Um, there is a proposal in Congress to uh, pass a new tax on imports called an impost. An impost is a tax on imports that's a flat percentage. So it's not, um, it doesn't vary by the item. Okay? Most, tax, most duties varied by the item, how much it was and all that. So it's a flat 5% imp impost on all the goods that are imported. I don't know how you're going to be able to sleep tonight having learned the difference between an impost and a, and a uh, customs duty. <laughs> yeah. 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 I don't have any coffee with that. You'll, really, you'll be wired all night. Uh, so that's the, the situation. But that gets uh, voted down because uh, Virginia says no, Rhode Island says no. And if two states say no, then that's, that's the whole game right there. You need a unanimous uh, agreement to enact. Uh, the, what, what, what it would take to enact that is an um, amendment to the Articles of Confederation. Amendments to the Articles of Confederation needed unanimous uh, approval. One oddity I'll point out before I move on here. Uh, it's not truly anonym, uh, a unanimous because um, they only wanted 12 out of 13. Georgia was not represented at all because it's so far and has the smallest population. So they just kind of agreed among themselves, Georgia doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> so Georgia, they just, just scratched them off the list. There are 12 colonies, 12 states now. If Georgia ever shows up, they can get in on this, but otherwise we're not waiting for them. Okay. So there are three that didn't approve, two, and one who just never shows up for anything. Uh, again, another indication of how seriously people take duty in the Continental Congress. 
So that's the memorial. And that's where things uh, stay until March of 1783. So the officers continue to wait. They've been waiting for well over a year to have the situation re resolved. They continue waiting. And then in early March, a letter circulates through camp. A letter that was anonymous on its face, but it was written by a young officer named uh, John Armstrong Jr. And he is an aide to uh, the General Horatio Gates, who after Washington is the most senior commander um, in uh, New York at that time, in that encampment. So kind of like the second in command after Washington. And this is a letter that is written in the house of uh, Gates, where Armstrong was living. And uh, some of his friends come over one night and they get talking to each other. I say, we should write a letter and it circulated to everybody, and then Armstrong gets, and he gets busy, and he does it, okay? Uh, I wonder what Horatio Gates thought about all this. It's inconceivable, he didn't know something was up. Like, he's like, shout down to John, there are too many people here, what are you doing with your friends? Tell them to go home. <laughs> like, don't worry, General, we're almost done. <laughs> Whatever it is. Okay, so that is uh, the letter. It circulates throughout the, throughout the encampment. So it goes um, throughout uh, New Windsor, goes down to West Point, and eventually be brought up to, uh, New, to, to Newburgh. It goes on and it makes an argument that the officers need to do something, that their memorial hasn't worked. The letter argues that the officers need to send a new message, a new message in writing in which they state more strongly their feelings but also a message in terms of what of action, or perhaps inaction. It recommends to the officers, send a message to Congress that whatever happens, war or peace, the officers have what Armstrong calls their alternatives. The alternatives being if uh, the, the British should renew the war, the officers don't have to fight. They can go home. They can remove themselves. They can resign and go home and leave you know, leave, leave the country to its own devices. Or if peace should arrive, the officers don't have to go home. They can stay in the field until appropriate terms are reached with Congress. Both of those are extremely dangerous. The one obviously because that could leave the country vulnerable to conquest by the British. The second one is extremely dangerous because that is a sign of a standing army. And if there's one thing that's a sure sign of tyranny, to 18th century Americans, it is a standing army. Okay, so a standing army is a professional mil military force that is out in the field, like active, during times of peace. The ideology of the time said that there was no reason, there was no good reason for a standing army. You could have some kind of reserve, a militia, certainly, who's ready to turn out at a moment's notice, but a standing army of professional soldiers that's maintained in during times of peace that can only be used for one reason, to take away the liberties of ordinary civilians. So that's the thinking of Americans at the time. That's what they're scared of. So that is all what Armstrong is recommending that the officers risk. And this is uh, one of the lines that he says at the end. Okay, send this message and be sure to, to let Congress know that the slightest mark of indignity from Congress now must operate like the grave and part you forever. So tell them it's now or never. Because if you continue your ways of delaying, oh, that's an answer. To not decide is to decide, right? We, we all know that. And they're going to say, that's OK, no response. That's, <clears throat> excuse me, that's your, that is your decision. We're done. You don't want the army to say, we're done to the civilians. When Washington learns of this, I would not have wanted to be the poor courier who had to ride up, <laughs> deliver that letter to Washington. Say, uh, General, excuse me, excuse me. There's this thing that's circulating among the men in camp. Um, maybe you should take a look at it. <laughs> what if Washington says, can you just summarize the contents for me? <laughs> uh, you really should read it yourself there, General. Uh, I found one account of Washington's reaction. And it's only two words, but it, it, it speaks volumes about, you can, you can use your imagination for the rest. It said that Washington was amazingly agitated Washington had a very bad temper. And across his life, he had managed mostly to keep it under control. So as he'd gotten older, he had mellowed some, but he'd just gotten better at controlling his temper. 
But if you, you, you know how people are who keep their emotions bottled up, right? When it comes out, it explodes, right? So I imagine that was probably what it was like. His military family really got the brunt of Washington's anger at that point. This is actually one of the things that Hamilton, why he resigns from Washington's staff, is he's tired of getting yelled at, of being absorbing all of Washington's emotional, right? It, you know, Washington keeps it buttoned up on, you know, outside, but inside he'll yell at Hamilton all the time. It's like, enough, I don't, I'm not being yelled at anymore. Okay, so that's uh, what happens, amazingly agitated. Washington's handling of, the, uh, of this letter is extremely skillful. It was exactly what was needed. Okay, whatever anger he had, he vented privately. Publicly, he projects this image of calm control. So he sends a, a, the, out in the daily general orders. First of all, he talks about the regular business. He gives the call so, the counter signs for to know who's an enemy and who's a friend. He talks about which, which unit is on duty, with, with all that kind of stuff. Court martial is gonna happen. And then, oh, by the way, there's been, I've taken notice of a letter that is circulated. <laughs> um, he does that to signal, oh, it's just business, it's just another thing on the list, not an existential threat to the army. It's just another thing we're gonna deal with. And he tells the officers that they may not meet as scheduled. So part of the letter from Armstrong is calling on the officers to meet um, like two days later and write this letter to Congress, okay? Washington says to the officers, you will not meet as scheduled. But he says, you will meet on Saturday. So the letter circulates on Monday. The orders say, no meeting today on Tuesday. You will meet on Saturday at noon at this building called the Temple of Virtue. And there you will decide, after mature reflection, you know, actually calm yourself down, um, what, me what measures are best calculated to obtain the object for which we uh, all strive, something like that. Okay. So it gives them time to cool off. He is allowing them to meet, because that would put, the, if he stamps down it too hard, that could lead to something else. But it keeps control. You can meet, but you'll meet on my terms, on my schedule, when I tell you to meet. Okay. Not outside the chain of command, like this letter has implied, but because I tell you, you can, you can meet. So he's reasserting the chain of command there. Okay. So that's uh, the message that he sends to his troops. And that, you know, it diffuses the situation enough, gives them time to think, he acts as if he is still in control, even if he's not. Portrays himself as always in control. Um, right? he, that's how he keeps the control on, uh, over things, is by acting as if he is. So that is Washington's um, message to his soldiers. Okay, so a couple more pictures here. So this is the Temple of Virtue. This is currently, um, so the, the Washington's house that I showed, this is Washington's house. So this is a historic site in New York. You can go visit it today. So that is the actual house that has been preserved. This is a, the Temple of Virtue is a replica. So the state of New York rebuilt it in the 1960s. Uh, these are all temporary, house, temporary structures, like the, the, the huts and stuff like that. That was torn down you know, in, the, in the 18th century. It wasn't meant to last. But it's been rebuilt as a, um, as, as a historic, historic site. And you can go visit, and I visited there in the summer of 2016 and took these pictures. Uh, that's not what the weather is like in March of 1783. Um, I grew up in western New York, so I know that's not what it looks like. Um, so that's what it looks like out there. This had recently been completed in February of 1783, and it was really kind of like a make-work project to give the guys something to get their energy out. Okay. It was a um, multi-purpose structure, so it was kind of like a meeting space, like we can meet and listen to a lecture. Um, they could have chapel there on Sundays. They could have parties if they wanted to. There are a couple of rooms at the either end that are kind of workspaces where uh, there's a storage area in there, okay? So that's, that's there. Uh, you can't really see it very well there, but I always like to point out that there is a fire extinguisher at the end. <laughs> I was very disappointed to see that because I want complete authenticity, <laughs> including the possibility of burning to death, okay. <laughs> because that's what they face all the time. Anytime you walk into a building, you know, you gotta be ready that there could be a fire you might need to evacuate, okay? So all those fire drill skills you learned back in uh, grade school, right? yeah. you still remember those? Yeah, you would have to know that all the time in the 18th century. What would have to happen when the building catches fire? That's a real thing. So I wanted that extra danger, but you don't get it. Those killjoys at the New York State uh, 
the safety standards. Okay, so that is the, the Temple of Virtue. That's what the interior looks like. Uh, the men would have stood, the, those, those, those benches there that look like 18th century benches, those are made by the Parks uh, Service so they can have programs in there, right? Um, they look authentic, don't they? They're wood and everything like they use. There's a raised dais at uh, one end okay, where the speaker could stand. On the morning um, of uh, 1783, as it gets to noon and the meeting is about to start, there's about 100 men gathered inside. And it's about to be noon to start the meeting and they hear there's somebody else is coming. You hear the horse outside. It's General Washington showing up unannounced. His previous message, Washington never said he was going to attend the meeting. He implied this is a meeting for officers. And he walks in the door. You can just imagine what that's like. <laughs> Washington was one of these guys, and it's, it's just so hard to express this, who there's some people like this, who when they just enter a room, all eyes are on them. He says that kind of magnetic personality. It, we, you may have known someone like this, a celebrity, like everybody looks. I'm like, huh, right? If, that, that's him. That's how Washington's effect on everyone. He asked the men for permission to address them. I right? showed them the respect that this is your meeting, and he's not just going to barge in. He's asking to be admitted. They're not going to say no. And he knows that, of course. <laughs> so he walks to the dais and stands there. I know Washington's tall. He's above average height. Uh, there's, some, there's debate about actually how tall he is. Uh, depends whether you, some people say he was 6'4", but that seems to be a measurement that was done after he died and his toes were pointed like this. <laughs> <laughs> he told his own tailor that he was six foot tall, but his clothes rarely fit, so maybe he didn't. Maybe he was actually bigger than he thought, and that's why his clothes never fit. Okay, so like 6'1", six, 6'2", six, in there, okay. So he's not like seven feet tall or something like that, right? Um, you know, above, certainly above average height, okay. He has to have that command, it's more Washington's commanding presence, right? He stands there, perfect military, um, uh, perfect military bearing. And he delivers a, about a 20 minute address to the men of his composition. And he goes on uh, and he implores them not to take any steps that they will regret later on. He asks them to remember all the sacrifices that they've made and the, the name that they've won for themselves by defeating the British Army. But no one thought that they could. They've achieved more together than anyone ever thought possible. They have earned the right to enjoy all the honor that they think they deserve. Civilians may not recognize that, but you know, we men in this room, we recognize that we have truly deserve to be known as real soldiers. That's what he reminds them to. Do not throw that away lightly, because if you do, then this will defeat the entire purpose of the revolution. You'll be known for your infamy, right? not as the army that won the revolution, but as the selfish soldiers who spoiled it and tried to make a tyranny out of it. That's what he reminds them. At the end of the speech, oh, here's the, the quote here. He says, uh, let me entreat you gentlemen, Right, calling them gentlemen, that's a nice touch. On your part, not to take any measures which, viewed in the calm light of reason, will lessen the dignity and sully the glory you have hitherto maintained. So don't ruin your reputation now at the end. Washington um, finishes his speech, and it seems like he senses that something more is needed. It's not quite enough. Washington had brought with him several documents that he planned to leave with the officers as evidence of Congress's goodwill. Uh, one of these documents was a letter that Washington had received from one of his Virginia neighbors, a man named Jones, uh, who was uh, a, a delegate from Virginia to the Continental Congress. And Jones writes to Washington saying, look, we're working on this. You know how legislatures are, especially our legislature. This is just, we're working on it. We haven't ignored the army, okay? We're gonna get this solved. Um, so Washington goes to read that letter to the men. So he's going to just show them, leave it and show them, but now he thinks he's, he better read it. He picks up the letter and it turns out that he can't read it. <laughs> because he could read his own handwriting for his speech. He wrote it very large so he could read the thing. Okay? And he says, then he gets this smaller letter in an unfamiliar handwriting and uh-oh. Uh-oh, he can't read it. Washington had recently started wearing glasses in February that year. So, so about a month or so, he'd been wearing glasses. And he, he brought them with him, and he's got to put them on. There's a moment of awkwardness, I think. 
where he's trying to put his glasses on. Because these are not glasses like uh, we have today. You just can pop it on and off. You gotta like wrap them around your head back here. And so there's a kind of moment of awkwardness where you have to do that. See, it's so awkward for everyone to see me kind of act this out, right? How embarrassing for all of you. And then in order to smooth that over, like a gentleman always does, always smooths over life's um, awkwardness, he says some version of this statement here. Different men remembered it slightly differently, but some version of, um, you see, gentlemen, that I have grown not only gray, but also blind in your service. It's <laughs> a so little witticism there. And I think that's just a throwaway line from Washington just to say something, right? Break the, 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 break the tension there. But it seems to like, open, some kind of, open something else up. The men can see how Washington has suffered. Right? He might have the best living conditions, but they're not great. He, he has like, taken a, a, an enormous physical toll on their commander. They're reminded of that in front of them. And that act of kind of vulnerability is something that then leads the men to uh, reconsider what they may have planned. Okay. Um, I like to show here, how do I know it was hard to get those on? Because I struggled many times to put these glasses on my little boy. Okay. It's not easy. Okay. Although I bet Washington doesn't run saying, catch me uh, when it's time to put on glasses. He just, he just does it. Okay. Uh, Washington leaves the meeting. The men continue to deliberate. They decide to denounce the letter as infamous and they decide to ask Washington to intercede on their behalf with Congress. And Washington does that, he writes to Congress, but it's a bit anticlimactic. It's not as if Washington writing to Congress has this big effect. Uh, the news of the peace treaty arrives. Okay? Now it's really time to hustle the army out. And they start coming up with a plan to basically write promissory notes to all the officers, promising them money sometime in the future to get them out and home before anything worse happens. And that's all really the officers can take. And that's, that's basically it. It's either that or nothing. They're not going to rebel, so they have to take these IOUs and see, just hope for the best in the future. So they, uh, Congress actually approves, their, not, a, not a pension, but a lump sum, convert the pension into a lump sum, and that's what they're given IOUs for. Okay, so that's your money. Hopefully you get it someday. That's the best they can do. This uh, brings me to the to the end of uh, my talk here. So I just want to recap what I think the true danger was. So I don't necessarily think that the army was plotting to take over Washington and the stage a coup and march on Philadelphia or any of those more extreme positions. I think that what was most likely to happen is that they were likely to be infected with conspiracy thinking. Everybody in the 18th century is a conspiracy theorist. That's how they understand the world. Bad things don't happen by accident. They happen because somebody is out to get you. Does somebody cut you off in traffic on the way here? It's not just because they're, they're, they're frazzled and they've had a bad day or something. It's because they hate you. <laughs> they want you to be late and not to hear this great talk tonight. Or they want you to run you off the road. They are out to get you. That's the way 18th century people think. Okay. George Washington thinks that way too. Uh, this is where I got the title of the, le of the lecture from. He, said, he writes a letter saying, there's something very mysterious in this business. This whole whatever happened with the army to get them all upset, he thinks that maybe somebody in Philadelphia put them up to it. Because okay. Washington thinks in conspiracy terms also. Everybody does. I think the real danger, though, was not that there was a conspiracy, like men pulling the strings behind the scenes. I think what the real danger was is that once you get a bunch of angry men in a room and ask them to complain about things, they're going to get competitive with how extreme their complaining is. <laughs> Many of you belong to an HOA. <laughs> Have you been to an HOA meeting? And you'll see a different side of your neighbors than, you, than you'll, you'll see when you meet them out on the street, right? And those, those meetings go south pretty quickly. Right? You never thought people could fight over a tree and landscaping so much, right? They're ready to murder each other over who's cutting the grass surface and all that. Uh, a good indication of this was something that one of the officers wrote to his wife the night before. So this is on the night of March 14th. He writes to his wife. He says, this meeting's coming up. It could be good. We hash out all these problems. But should rashness govern the proceedings, the consequences may be such as are dreadful, even an idea. God forbid the event should be so calamitous. So he knows that this could, it could be a good thing or it could go very wrong. And who knows what's going to happen then. Maybe there really would be a sentiment to rebel against Congress and march on Philadelphia. Um, 
who knows? That didn't happen in the event, but that's certainly something that could have spiraled out of control very easily. That brings me to the end of my uh, lecture today. Uh, I want to thank you again for being an audience here today, coming out and listening so attentively. Um, I appreciate you laughing at my jokes too. That was good. <laughs> Always nice. Those, you know what? Those, those sleepy freshmen at class this morning, they didn't laugh. <laughs> those, those losers are still, they don't have a sense of humor. Okay. So I needed this. 